Hey everyone, welcome back to Making the Game from Concept to Kickstarter. In this podcast, I, Reese, the lead game designer for the game Blood Throne, discuss the process of going from tabletop gaming idea to the development cycle to crowdfunding, production, fulfillment, and more. In this episode 13, we're going to be talking about the Barbarian class in the game, and I'm doing this as a companion to the article that I wrote on the same topic to try and release them at the same time. Um, and this is going to be my first attempt at doing this as a video cast in addition to a podcast. So please forgive me if it looks a little amateurish. I haven't, um, I haven't edited, edited a YouTube video in a really, really long time. So I'm going to have to, uh, kind of put the training wheels on, on this one and, and relearn how to do it. Hopefully you enjoy it. And, um, if you have any feedback, of course, please let me know so that I can continue to improve. So first of all, the barbarian class is meant to be the melee DPS king. Uh, or in the case of the hero that comes in the core box, Kijo, the queen of melee DPS or, or damage per second. It's a, I'm sure the vast majority of you listening to this understand what that means, but it's just a term that means the class is designed to do lots of damage in melee. So you, you put this in contrast to the fighter who was the first class that we covered in, in the in-depth series, and the fighter is primarily designed to be a tank. Their job is to stand on the front lines and take damage and not die and also to draw aggro, as you would call it in a video game, or to force um, other models to attack them. Because obviously, if a model is designed to be attacked but not take much damage, any intelligent person or you know, AI script for a monster is going to try and avoid that. So the fighter's job is to get you stuck on them and let the rest of their team do what they want to do. Barbarian's job is to go in and actually take uh, enemy monsters or in PvP, to take other heroes out in melee. That's what they're designed to do. So <laughs> the Barbarian's primary skill tree is, is melee DPS or melee damage. The secondary skill tree is tankiness. So they're meant to be the second most durable class in the game um, behind only the fighter. And as a tertiary skill tree, they have mobility. Uh, they only have one class skill in that, but the idea is the Barbarian doesn't want to necessarily get stuck. They want to have at least one a uh, tool in their toolbox to allow them to move around the tabletop freely so that they can attack what you want them to attack. So one of the things I forgot to mention in depth when we were discussing the fighter is equipment restrictions. Equipment restrictions are one of the key parts of class design to help them feel unique. Um, when we first started making the game, we let anybody take anything. And then you ended up with parties where it's like everybody had a bow or everybody was dual wielding war hammers or you know, whatever the playtesters thought was the most ideal equipment loadout. And it, it, the freedom was fun, but it didn't, it, it got away from the core idea that this is a class based party based game where every uh, mem party member has a specific role. Like as again, as opposed to a game like D and D where you're playing a single character, but you're playing with a group of people, you know, usually uh, four is, is one of the more common sizes, two to four. Um, and you want every person to fill a role in the team so you don't have any shortcomings, right? Like you want a healer, you want a tank, you want a wizard, you want a, a rogue that can disarm traps, traps, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea with Blood Throne is that you get to do that, but you get to do it with one person controlling the whole party, right? So like playing a CRPG, some of my favorite games like you know, Baldur's Gate or Pillars of Eternity or whatever, you get to kind of custom build a whole team as opposed to a single character. So with that kind of core design concept in mind, we decided to put equipment restrictions on to the classes to kind of, we didn't want to force people to do what we wanted them to do, but to like at least kind of like guide them into that. And we didn't want to be as restrictive as some games where, for example, um, Dragon's Dogma came to mind. It was a game I just um, played and enjoyed uh, where it's like, you know, oh, if you're a rogue, you can only ever deal dagger weapons or you know, if you're a, a barbarian, you can basically, there's like a very narrow selection of two-handed weapons that you can only ever take. And we didn't want to be that restrictive. We wanted to give people the freedom to be creative because that's where the real fun is, is in dreaming up your own idea. Like, this is the way I want to build my barbarian. And we'll talk about that as we go through this. But we did, we did want to avoid people purposely doing something with it that, that we didn't intend on that, that could be game-breaking. We want people to do things we didn't think of we don't want people to do things we didn't think of that makes the game not fun. Uh, for example, we had people taking like two shields or like, um, you know, dual wielding spears, which <clears throat> to, to be fair on that second one, the dual wielding shields is just 
silly, right? From a game mechanic perspective, totally. But in real life, you're never going to see someone charging into battle with two shields unless there's just some bizarre circumstance where they didn't have any other choice. Um, so, and then two spears, admittedly, I was like, that's just ridiculous. Like, that wouldn't happen outside of like a war boy in, uh, in um, uh, Mad Max Fury Road, you know, where they're jumping off the, the vehicle with two exploding spears, which was admittedly very cool. Anyway, uh, not to go too far into it, we just, we wanted restrictions that felt sensible. Right. We didn't want we wanted to do the least amount possible to have the class do what we wanted it to do. Um, so it, it ends up being like a really big part of of class design. So the fighter has to take a shield. That's basically their only restriction. And then they can't take a ranged weapon. Right. So, again, because we found in playtesting, if you had a team of all ranged characters and then you manipulated it so that their initiative was really high. So they went first. And you got like six long range shots before the other person even got to activate it. Just, it wasn't fun. Like you'd end up assassinating two of their characters before they did anything. Um, smart from a, you know, optimization standpoint and from a, a, you know, utilizing the game mechanics, but not really very fun, which is, should always be your number one guiding principle when you're making a game that's meant to be fun. <clears throat> so that was it for the fighter and the fighter could take up to heavy armor is one of the only classes that can do that. It's the only class in their core box that can take heavy armor. The Barbarian has a similar amount of restrictions. They're very limited. Can't take any ranged weapons, and you can go up to medium armor, right? So the Barbarian cannot take heavy armor. They can go up to medium, and then they can't take any ranged weapon, but from there, you can do whatever you want. So when you're building the Barbarian, um, your, your own custom Barbarian, you're basically going to want to choose, do I want to go more tank-oriented, uh, or do I want to go more offense-oriented? So Kijo, the barbarian that's in the box, is built kind of in the middle. She has medium armor. She has a, a two-handed great weapon, which are the most powerful two-handed weapons, so she does a ton of damage in melee. But she took as her, her general or her archetype feat, which I'll explain that a little bit further into the episode, uh, the two-hander or the great weapon training uh, feat. It used to be called two-hander. Uh, the great weapon training feat gives her more damage, but it also lets her get one free parry with her, her great weapon. So once per activation, she can do a free parry action without having any penalties. So it lets her have some damage reduction. Medium armor is the second best armor in the game that you can get. And she hits like a truck. So when you're building your own custom barbarian, you basically that's where you're gonna, your head's going to be at. Like, do you want to go out all out offense? Or do you want to mix in some defense or really lean into defense? So if you wanted to go more defensive oriented, you could take a one-handed weapon and a shield. That would be your, in medium armor, that would be the most defensive oriented. Or you could do what I did in playtesting, which was a lot of fun. Took no armor. And then I had uh, dual wielding axes with a dwarf because I wanted to make him look like a dwarf slayer from Warhammer for anybody who's familiar with that. They're really, really cool, fun characters. And I took all the different upgrades to get maximum HP. So even though I had no way of reducing damage, I had enough HP where you could just soak it in um, for a long time before getting knocked out. So at any rate, when you're building a Barbarian, that's pretty much where your head's going to be at. Do I want to go more well-rounded, more defensive-oriented, or do I want to go maximum offense, um, dual-wielding, or with a two-handed weapon? Now, as I had mentioned earlier, when you're building a character from level one, and as an aside, the heroes in the core box, they're all pre-built to level one, right? So they're uh, general feet and their archetype feet, which you get two at level one, which really help kind of shape the direction that you are going to have your character or your hero go in. Those are pre-selected. So in the hero expansion, it gives you the rules for making your own custom heroes. When you do that, there's a lot of options, right? And so Kijo, as I explained, her archetype feet, meaning this is a feat that's available to her as a martial archetype character, is the great weapon training feat, which I already explained. Her general feat was tough, right? Which gives her extra HP at level one and then extra HP at each odd level. Heroes gain extra HP at level three, five, seven, and nine. So she would get one extra HP at each one of those steps. So the tough general feat is very commonly chosen. It just, it, it just gives you, it's a lot of bang for your buck. Over the course of the hero going from level one to level 10, which is max level, it gives you quite a bit of extra HP. It's eight, I believe off the top of my head, eight additional HP, which is a lot. In, um, in Blood Drum. But the, the reason I bring this up is that I wanted to take the time to explain that we, include, we built into the game ways to specialize uh, your hero, especially like a martial hero, 
um, all of the specializations or all of the archetypes, martial skill and arcane have these uh, options available. But as it pertains specifically to martial characters, which are the easiest to visualize, you have a choice of feats that lets you kind of really lean into whatever you want to do. So if you want to dual wield, you have to take the dual wielding feat. It unlocks the ability to take to make uh, an attack action with both hands as one action. So it really increases the odds of hitting because you make two action rolls. And it increases your damage output significantly. Um, then there's the Great Weapon feat, which I just explained. It increases the damage and it increases your defense a little bit. We also included like the, <clears throat> the Duelist training um, feat. So, for example, if you wanted to build a character that only used one weapon in one hand, like uh, a Duelist with a, uh, like a Musketeer type character with a Rapier, or a Samurai with a Katana, from a rules perspective, a mechanics perspective, that would be a poor choice because every hero, <clears throat> excuse me, has a main hand and an off hand. And if you're not utilizing one of those slots from just from a rules perspective, it would be much less effective. But in real life, that was very common, right? Uh, that, was, that was a very normal way for um, a person that was engaged in sort of martial combat to, to behave. So then we built in a feat that gives you a lot of bonuses if you decide to forego using your offhand and you just want to make a character that looks cool or looks the way you want them to look. So we, we took a lot of time to build these sort of options into the game so that you never felt stupid for taking a hero that looks the way you want it to look and not feel like you're being punished from a rules perspective, right? And so to like kind of put a bow on that, uh, the shield option, like for example, if you want to take a barbarian with an axe and a shield, obviously very iconic. <clears throat> the shield eats up one of your hand slots, which reduces your offense, but the shield allows you to use a block action. The block action is the best defensive action in the game. It roughly halves the damage that you take, and it works in melee, but it also works against ranged attacks, which includes spells that don't do raw damage, raw damage, bypass, armor, and um, any form of damage reduction. So it's it's... You're losing that, you know, you can't take a great weapon, a two-handed weapon, or a, um, an extra melee weapon, but you're getting the best defensive option in the game. It also in statically increases your evasion, and your evasion, of course, is the stat that determines how hard you are to hit with physical attacks. It would be like armor class in d, &D. So we, we took a lot, we spent a lot of time trying to make all these different, you know, build types or specking your character in video game parlance. Like, you can come up with a build that's based on aesthetics, right? Like, I want to make a character that looks like uh, Ragnar Lothbrok from the movie Vikings to be my, my barbarian, and you can do that. And the rules won't punish you. Now, I'm sure there's going to be people that think that X, Y, or Z, you know, spec is optimal, is, is the quote-unquote best, but we wanted to do our best to make all the options feel um, viable. So we tested all these options. The Barbarian was actually one of the most popular classes in playtesting. My business partner beat my bottom with, uh, with him quite a few times. Um, there's just something about the Barbarian class that's very appealing, especially the, just the raw amount of damage they can do, which I'll explain as we go. And um, we, we tested all the options. We, and we tried all like really goofy stuff too. We tried like Goblin Barbarians and all this sort of stuff, and it, it all worked. It really just comes down to the way you want... Um, the Barbarian to play for you and your own custom party. And if you want them to be more tanky, or if you want them to just be all out, just smashing faces. Okay, so as we said, we're going to dive into the Barbarian and look at all of their available options. So their primary skill tree is DPS. Now, in a previous episode, I discussed how we had every class has an archetype within which it fits. So there's the overarching archetype of, am I a martial character? Am I a skill-based character, or am I an arcane character, like, you know, a wizard? And within each of those archetypes, we have a sub-archetype that determines the role for the, that class within that um, overarching structure. So we did this because as we go forward and we start building faction-specific, uh, <clears throat> um, we, we come out with factions in the game, uh, we wanted there to be parity between one faction and another. So the fighter is the tank archetype, and every faction will have their tank archetype. So the Dark Knight is the uh, mirror to the fighter for the Iconoclast. Fighter is available to the Adherence to Zenith faction, and the Dark Knight is available to the Iconoclast faction. Um, and as a quick reminder, 
those are sort of like broad factions. Those are like the start, the two starting factions that are an amalgamation of basically all the other factions that are underneath those umbrellas. Then <clears throat> I'll explain that more in depth, but I've covered it in previous podcasts. Suffice it to say, those are the two starter factions, and they're they're casting a wide net. You can kind of draw on the lore of any of the other factions to bring them in to those umbrellas. At any rate, the fighter is the sort of the tank for the adherence to Zenith, and the Dark Knight is the tank for the iconoclasts. They both serve the same function of being there to absorb damage and to try and force people to attack them. They go about it in totally different ways. So the melee DPS um, archetype within those, the Barbarian is it for the Iconoclasts, <clears throat> and the Paladin is that for the Adherence to Zenith. The, bar- the Barbarian accomplishes this, um, this role of being the melee DPS, DPS specialist with their class ability. The class ability, again, is what it, you always get it, right? It doesn't take up one of your uh, skill selection choices. It's just it's the definitive ability for the class. For the fighter, it's their untiring ability where they heal every turn. For the barbarian, it's called cleave. Obviously, if you've played any RPG, you're pretty familiar with this combo of uh, barbarian and cleave. It's like the PB and J of, uh, of fantasy gaming. <clears throat> we felt like it fit perfectly. Didn't see any reason to try and uh, change it. Basically, what it is is the barbarian. If they're engaging two opposing models, two enemies, and they successfully hit one they can make a free attack on the other, right? This is the core of what makes the Barbarian a DPS machine. So if you position the model correctly, you can get one free attack per activation, meaning you could potentially hit three models, or you could hit two models with one attack and then hit another one with uh, with their second action or potentially hit three different models, right? So this obviously is a dramatic increase in potential damage output over any other character. And this is the core of what makes the Barbarian um, just, a, just a, a, a knockout machine. And as you can see at level eight, you can take a feat which upgrades this skill called Bloody Slaughter, which lets you cleave another time per activation. So you could, if, if you can line it up, you could go into two models, hit them both, go into another two models, hit them both, and it just it makes the potential damage for the Barbarian just ludicrous. Uh, it's also really, really fun. Uh, it doesn't always come up. There's not always enemies clustered together like that. But when it does, it's, it's devastating. Um, the, next, the next class skill that the Barbarian has, and this is available at level 1, is called Take You With Me. This is a skill that you don't want to ever have to use, obviously, because it, it triggers when you're knocked out. You know, obviously, you don't want your heroes getting knocked out. But it does happen. On average, we found that two heroes got knocked out per game in PvE and PvP was more. Um, but basically, when a model knocks you out, as a free reactive action. And again, reactive actions are the only thing you can do when your model's not active, when it's not their turn. And free actions don't take up any of your, uh, your action economy. So it's a reactive action. When you're knocked out, you get to hit back. You have to hit the model that knocked you out if possible. If not, like if someone shot you from long range or whatever, you can hit anybody in range. So it's extremely useful um, in PvE. It's obviously, it's really good because you can take one more monster down in PvP. It's, it's like more psychologically powerful because someone is like, oh gosh, if I, if I bop the Barbarian, he's going to get one more shot on me. And it's, it's really, really, really strong. Um, again, like when you have a limited amount of class skills, you may not always take it, but every time you take it, you are, you're thankful you did. So that one's a, a really, really useful uh, ability. Um, an- another level one class skill, and again, <clears throat> at level one, you have a choice of three skills and you always get your class ability. We did this because we wanted to front load the power of heroes at low level. We didn't, I, I think it's silly when you have to wait to get, oh, my character really comes into his own at level 12. It's like, most people never get that far when they're playing RPGs. So we wanted the heroes to feel really strong in the beginning. And then they get incrementally better as you go. And it also lowers the disparity between a low level hero and a high level hero because, you know, in a PvP uh, setting, if you have a level two character and the other person's level eight, you don't want it to be totally impossible for that. You want to have a, a puncher's chance to be able to win in that, in that encounter. That's why we did it that way. So, Barbaric Battle Cry is available at level one. This is a, a shout action. Shout actions are almost always. Simple actions, meaning they take up um, your, your 0.5 action. Uh, as a quick recap, you have two standard actions and one simple action per activation. 
a simple action is something that's like, it's not quite a full action. It's sort of an in-between. Um, in d and I think they now, they call it your quick action, I think is what they call it in 5e. I can't, I can't remember um, specifically, uh, or a swift action is what they used to call it. But at any rate, a simple action is something that doesn't eat up into your main, your meat and potatoes actions of like move, attack, cast a spell, etc. So shout actions are almost always simple actions. They function similarly to, to spells, but they're, they're not. And in this instance, the barbarian lets out a mighty uh, war cry. Everyone that's engaging the barbarian, everyone that's, that's engaging the barbarian is a, um, targeted. You roll, goes against will. And if it's successful, it gives them the Dazzled status effect. Dazzled is a really, really powerful negative status effect. Um, <clears throat> we call it an affliction. Afflictions last for one turn. But it, low, it halves their evasion, right? It's really good because the Barbarian really, really wants to hit. They want to connect with their attacks because that's their main job is to go in and just do damage. But it also makes it so anybody else attacking that model is going to have a, a better, uh, higher chance of achieving it if it's a physical attack. Uh, really powerful. If you take this class skill, you just you're just you're just you're going to pop it every turn because it's a simple action. And if you upgrade it, if you upgrade it with the savage or I'm sorry, one stands alone uh, feet upgrade, it then also gives the barbarian panoptic, and it, uh, models can't get the benefit of um, flanking on the barbarian. So what that means. Panoptic gives you 360 degree line of sight when you are the active model, meaning when it's your turn. And this is huge because obviously with Cleave, if there's models behind you in your rear arc, which normally you wouldn't be able to target them because they're out of line of sight, now you can hit anyone that's in range of your weapon that, is, um, that you're engaging. So it makes, it makes Cleave much more effective. And then also it just means you can just attack behind you. Like you can just rotate and face the model and attack them without burning an action, it's really good. And then the models not being able to get the benefit of um, flanking or ganging up on you is really important. So when two models are attacking one enemy model, the two models attacking gain plus one advantage, right? So we built into the rules model positioning ben benefits that increase the odds of you doing what you wanna do. So since the barbarian is usually waiting right in there, you know, hell bent for leather, they get ganged up on a lot. So this upgrade to that skill is really good. Obviously, if you're not using that skill, don't, don't sweat it. But if you do, it makes it even better. At level two, you get Barbaric Blow. This is like bread and butter. Pretty much always, always take this card in your deck when you're building your, your deck for your Barbarian. It's super simple. All it does is you declare, I'm going to use Barbaric Blow. And then if you hit with that attack, you add plus two Power Dice, which is big. It's a huge... It's a huge increase in damage, right? Your maximum power is four. So, <clears throat> and Kijo starts with power three. So it's like you're going from adding three damage dice to five. You always take this, right? So the only downside to this, obviously you can only use it once per activation. And it makes, it turns what would be a, a standard action into a special action. So it could be denied by uh, any hero that has a, di a denial ability like an Inquisitor or the Warlord. Um, so that's the only thing to think about when you're playing that in, um, in a PvP setting or in PvE when you're playing against monsters that can deny abilities. These sort of like just extra damage cards, which we do, there's a lot of classes that have these. They're super fun to use because you throw just, you're throwing like a handful of dice and you usually just splatter whatever you attack. <clears throat> you have to just bear in mind that your opponent's going to be looking to try and block those. Um, that's the only, only thing to bear in mind with those. It, it, otherwise... Barbaric Blow is going to be in 90% of the Barbarian player's decks because it's, it's just good. Um, at level 6, you get access to Whirlwind of Death. Whirlwind of Death is an attack that you attack everyone you're engaging, right? So you just imagine the Barbarian like spinning in a circle, sort of like Diablo, just smashing everybody. It's great. Uh, you cannot use Cleave with it. Um, it's the only restriction. It's an awesome ability. Um, at level 8, you get Opportunistic Retaliation. This is a, a really, really powerful ability. And it, at first blush, when you're first reading it, you're like, well, this sounds kind of weird. It's basically when someone gets a free strike on you in Attack of Opportunity. So if you leave engagement or there's any number of things you can do if you're trying to open a, um, an objective, if you're trying to pick up an objective, anyone that's engaging you gets a free strike. So what this does is if someone free strikes you, you get to hit them back. Um, so it's yet another attack that the Barbarian gets to do out of the normal attack sequence. The Barbarian has... Lots of reactive abilities, which are, again, those are things that you're doing that aren't 
burning one of your actions. It just increases their potential damage output more and more and more. So what this, this pairs extremely well with um, Reckless Charge, which <clears throat> is their mobility-based skill. Reckless Charge, which is also available at level one, lets you make a, declare a charge even if another model is engaging you. Right? Normally, if a model is in, you know, engaging you, they're in base-to-base -base or they're uh, one square away with a reach, you can't declare a charge, right? <clears throat> so that's a core part of the strategy of the game is like tagging, so like especially just like touching a barbarian in the rear arc, so he, he has to turn around, burn an action, and deal with you. Or whatever, or if you're stuck on a wimpy monster and you want to go attack like a more powerful monster, with uh, Reckless Charge, you just declare the charge. You still get the attack of opportunity against you. Sometimes it's you either don't care because it's going to be barely do any damage to you, like if a wizard is on you and they're going to just bonk you with their staff and do like two damage. It's like, who cares? Just take it and go make the charge you want. Or it's worth the risk, right? Oh, it's like, I need to win the game. I need to get over to this other uh, monster or, or opposing model. That's what Reckless Charge is for. When you get to level eight, on the way out the door, you can also hit the person that hits you, right? So it, it, it turns into this game of like, uh, a monster is going to automatically uh, attack of opportunity. They, they never don't. But in a, in, in a PvP game, your opponent might be like, hey, you know what? Just go, dude. I'm not going to hit you because I don't want to take the massively powerful attack back from, um, from the Barbarian. Uh, at level 10, you unlock your ultimate ability. So um, as a reminder, your ultimate class ability, uh, you just put it in your deck automatically. You don't have to um, use a, a skill card to take it. <clears throat> This, and these are like their, you know, super abilities. If you were playing War Machine, for anyone's familiar with that game, this would be your feat. Um, so there's this called Berserker Fury. It's really, really strong. <clears throat> so this is played when the Barbarian would be knocked out. So instead, you are not knocked out. You become invulnerable for one turn, meaning you cannot go to zero HP. And every action that you take while this status effect is in play gains plus one advantage, which just means it's more likely to, to occur. And then at the beginning of the following turn, once the effect wears off, right? So you get one full turn to use it. When you would activate thereafter, you die no matter what. You just get knocked out. Doesn't matter if you got feel, um, healed back up to full health or whatever. So basically it gives you one hyper-powered turn when you would have been knocked out. It's extremely good. Um, getting to level 10 is challenging. Not, not every uh, hero in your party in a campaign will. It's usually only a, a few of them that do. Unless you just absolutely, you know, play every scenario and max out every opportunity to get HP. Um, the, the game has enough HP built into it, or I'm sorry, XP, to take everyone to 10. It's just in practice, it doesn't always work out. But if your Barbarian does get to 10, look out, because they are going to be absolutely brutal. And then again, you know, if you're in combat, when you get knocked out, you could... Um, you could also use Take Me With You. <laughs> so you just have a ton of opportunity to do tons of damage. Really, really fun. Um, for their secondary skill tree, which is uh, tankiness or, or the ability to absorb damage, they have one class skill. It's called Defiance. It's a really, really cool skill. Um, it comes at level four. And once per game, is a simple action. They can do a shout action. And they heal themselves their power characteristic in raw dice to heal. So it's basically like... You, you could take this and a heal potion because every hero can take one consumable. So it's basically like an extra heal potion that, you know, you get to do as a simple action. Um, really useful. Uh, initially, we had had it as something you could use every turn, but it took a, it burned a, a standard action to use it. And we found that people playing the Barbarian, were like they would take it because they would think they would use it. And they were like, I'd rather just attack, right? And so we switched it to once per game um as a simple action and they just they shout so hard they heal themselves it's it's, it's great um really really useful skill and uh, one that you'll find yourself um, choosing to take especially if you do an hp sponge build on your barbarian um like kijo is built is built not maximized in that way but she's built in that direction she has the most hp of any hero um it's really useful for on barbarians that are built like in that way because they'll get to use it and it'll keep them in the fight for at least, you know, usually it gives buys them one more turn of, um, of action. Okay, so now we'll dive into the feats that are available to the Barbarian. As a quick reminder, every class has uh, custom feats that are available only to their class at levels 2, 4, 6, and 8. And then there are general feats which are available to all classes that are available at 3, 5, 7, and 9. 
At level five and nine, though, just to add a little bit extra information, it's a stat boost point, right? So <clears throat> that's the only thing you can do, but it's awesome. You get to increase one of your stats. And then at level three and level seven are the general skills that are available. They're universal. Every class has access to them. So for the, the barbarian, much like the fighter, has two branching um, options that are available, two, four, six, and eight. And at every juncture, you can take um, one, only one, and it's a permanent choice. That applies to general skills as well. Each branch op uh, emphasizes either offense or defense, right? So as you're leveling up your barbarian, you can choose to take a feat that's going to make you better at punching or better at taking a punch. And just as a reminder, feats are passive. Whereas class skills are active, you use them with your card in the game. Feats are just always on. Um, and they either increase some of your basic stats or they modify an existing skill. If they modify a skill, it will be on the class skill card, which you'll see here in this video format, which makes it a lot easier. Um, so that it, you don't, you're not you know, burning too much mental space trying to remember everything. At level two, you can choose between two really good feats. Uh, the first one is called Hardened by Life, um, and that gives you plus four HP. What we found is the, because the Barbarian plays so aggro that they're taking a lot of damage. So we threw in the option just to get more HP, um, right, basically right away, right? At level two, you hit that really quickly. <clears throat> and as, uh, as an aside, I just wanted to explain, like, um, use as an example of one of the cool ways that you can customize your Barbarian or, or any hero for that matter to... I, I just want to use this as an, as an illustrative example of, of how much freedom there is to, to spec out a really cool hero. So I mentioned earlier that I used, took like a Dwarf Slayer inspired barbarian that had, didn't wear any you know, armor, um, ran around in a loincloth with two axes, and I thought it was funny, but we wanted in the rules for it also to be good. So what I did is I took a, a Mountain Dwarf Heritage. Heritage, we use that term, it's like race in, in RPGs. Um, for Blood Throne, because like there's dwarves in like every faction, we wanted to be more specific, so we used the term heritage, which is a combination of race and ethnicity. So Mountain Dwarf is they're really tough, right? So they start out with plus two HP, and their heritage skill is uh, <clears throat> tenacious. Which the first time they get knocked out, they don't get knocked out. They stay at one HP, and they gain the stunned affliction, which they lose um, one action. It's really really good. Um, and then at level one, I took Tough, which is the general feat that Kijo also have. It's plus three HP at level one, and then plus one HP at level three, five, seven, and nine, which is when heroes gain HP, as I said. So you, by default, you get one HP, right? So characters that don't care about having tons of HP, they're only going to get plus one HP at level three, five, seven, and nine, like the down in the rogue in the, in the game is built that way. Tough gives you an additional plus one, right? So you're getting two at level three, five, seven, and nine, but you also add in your constitution characteristic. So <clears throat> I built my, my dwarf slayer barbarian with four constitution, which you get that at level one. And then you get plus four HP at level three, five, seven, and nine. So as you can see, it, the amount of HP you get is, is wild, right? But since he didn't have any armor or any ability to defend himself, I wanted to be able to just not worry about defending myself and just take it. Um, if you choose not to take any armor when you're building your own custom hero at level one, there is a, um, there's like a, the anti-armor choice, which is called natural vigor, which also gives you plus four HP. So we wanted you to be able to build like a Conan style barbarian or, or any hero, uh, cause anybody can take natural vigor so that if you wanted to go bare chested for whatever reason, or, or you wanted someone that looked like they didn't have a lot of armor on, like a, like a monk character, we wanted you to be able to do that in the rules but then not feel stupid like, oh, I'm just not, I just gave up any opportunity to have any sort of a benefit in my uh, armor slot, which there's only one, right, in, a, in Blood Throne because we manage multiple heroes, we didn't want it to be overwhelming. Like, what left grieve does my third hero have? <clears throat> so you take Natural Vigor, level one, gives you plus four HP. Once you hit level two, you take Hardened by Life, which is available only to the Barbarian, which gives you another plus four HP. And then at every level, you're getting um, plus six HP. So by the time you get to level nine, it's just ridiculous. You have like, you know, four X the HP of like a rogue character, like Downing, who just was like, I'm going to focus on being hard to hit and I'm not going to focus on being able to take it. So I explain all this um, only to show you 
the amount of options that you have, right? Like you could alternatively take a barbarian with medium armor, a shield, and a sword, and soak dam like just to ignore damage, you know, through damage reduction and blocking, and not worry about maximizing your HP. Lots of options, right? I I just want to be able to I just want to kind of put the ideas in your mind of how many options you have when you can make um, your own custom hero. So that long aside aside. Your other choice for a feat at level two is Bloodlust. Bloodlust is extremely good. So when a Barbarian knocks out an, a, an opponent, either a, a monster in PvE or a opposing hero in PvP, they get a free move. They have to move towards the closest nearest enemy model. Anytime you get free movement in a game, in a miniatures game, it's massively good, right? So like you can have a Barbarian with Bloodlust that just feels like this relentless machine knocking things out going forward. If you knock him out, he's going to knock you out. Um, and that was exactly what we were going for when we built it. <laughs> At level four, you have the choice between Berserker and One Stands Alone. Um, Berserker, it's really, really good. You're going to hear me say this a lot because I, I think we did a good job of, of making all the options feel good. Every time they take damage from an action, they gain the Berserk uh, status effect. So what that means is someone has to act, act on you. It's not like having a DOT that's ticking every turn. They just constantly triggering berserk it has to be an action that targets you and when you have the berserk uh status effect you gain plus one power plus one advantage and you have to charge the nearest enemy model so it's it's really powerful but then when the, at the end of your turn you take two uh red dice worth of damage which could be up to six damage it's very powerful so it's if you want like a balls to the wall style barbarian that's just like full blast going into it uh which it feels very on brand for a barbarian you can do that and then one standalone, we, we already explained, it modifies the Barbaric Battle Cry uh, class skill. At level six, you have two very simple but very, very powerful options. You can either increase your power statistic by plus one, which is going to increase the damage that you do on every attack, um, or it can increase the amount you heal if you take uh, the Defiant skill, or you can increase your damage reduction by plus one. Really, really, both of those are extremely good, right? So if you took medium armor, like Kijo has medium armor, it would take her up to armor three, which is where Ajax is. Uh, or you can just increase your offense even more. It just depends on, just depends on what you want. They're both really, really good. Uh, finally, at level eight, you can either increase Cleave with Bloody Slaughter, um, which we've already explained, let you cleave a uh, second time. Or you can take Resist the Witch. Resist the Witch is a passive plus two bonus to, your, bonus to your will defense. So again, in the game, you have Evasion, which is your kind of general... Uh, defensive statistic, and then you have Fortitude and Will, which defend against special attacks. Fortitude is things that attack your body. Will is things that attack your mind or your spirit. And martial characters are usually have usually have really low will, so they're very vulnerable to like mental attacks. This just passively gives you a, a benefit to that. So Bloody Slaughter seems like the obvious choice, I think, to most people. But what we found in playtesting is it it doesn't come up more than maybe once or twice in a game where you get to cleave twice in one activation. It's pretty hard to do. When it does work, it's, it could be game winning, right? <clears throat> now, for somebody that doesn't want to worry about it or is sick of their barbarian getting mind controlled, just take plus two will. It's, it's very, very useful. So now focusing on playing Kijo, the hero in the box game, in the core game specifically, Kijo is built with a mix of offense and defense in mind. She leans more towards offense. So she starts out with 24 HP, which is the most in the game. It's more, it's, she's, she's really beefy. She can take a punch, <clears throat> but, but her evasion is one, which is the lowest. Like that's, you can go to zero evasion, but it's pretty rare. Like basically anyone that attacks her is going to hit her. Um, now again, because she has the great weapon training general or archetype feat at level one, once per activation, she can parry with her great weapon. Normally, when you parry, you gain the disarm status on the weapon that you parried with, meaning you can't attack with it in your next activation. Obviously, that would be crippling for a character like Kijo, that that's what she's there to do is smash people with her Tetsubo. So she really is there. Like Her defensive strategy is parry that one attack per activation, that you, the, the most powerful one that you want to reduce the damage roughly by half. And then basically, you just take it on the rest of them. So you want to you make sure to have the ability to heal her. Giving her a healing potion is always a good idea. Or having a character nearby that can heal her. Obviously, Brother Boldstand, the priest, is the best option 
Tatian, the Dread Mage, can also um, heal pretty well, or Jibjob, the Alchemist. They're going to want to be somewhat near, because Kidra will get knocked out, <clears throat> despite having medium armor, which takes two damage dice out of the damage pool every time that she's hit, and having 24 HP. Um, the fact that she's just right in the middle of things, smacking people, means she gets attacked a lot, and then with Evasion 1, very rarely getting missed. So you just want to think about that uh, when you're playing her. Now, on the upside, when you're looking at one of the first things you'll notice when you see your hero board, which should be on the screen right now, if my video editing skills are up to par, which they should be, uh, she has base damage 7, which is ludicrous. That's, that's literally the highest you can get. So a great weapon uh, is the most powerful melee weapon. Starts out with base damage 6. Because of her, her great weapon training, she adds plus 1 to that. So she's throwing 7 dice base. Plus she has power 3. Excuse me. So when she's attacking, she's throwing 10 dice, which is insane. Um, and the fact that her Tetsubo also has the armor piercing keyword, every weapon has at least one keyword. Ajax's sword has the accurate keyword, which means swirls on the action dice automatically count as explosions. So it increases his odds of hitting by a significant amount. The armor piercing keyword automatically activates black explosions on any action dice as critical hits, meaning you replace a white die with a red die. Again, the red dice or raw dice ignore armor, can't be blocked. So it just it, it increases her damage output even more and it helps her to overcome high armor uh, enemies. So she's just built to smash things. She also has a really good accuracy at four, which is very high. So she's not going to miss very often. And if you combo that with <clears throat> the barbaric uh, battle cry class skill and she's having the evasion of her target or the targets near her, that really dramatically increases not only her accuracy, but it gets you more mileage out of the armor piercing special rule. So to recap really quickly, when you're throwing more offensive modifier dice at your opponent than they have defensive modifier dice, it increases the amount of uh, critical hits that you can get. So for her, anything that can increase her accuracy and lower her target's uh, evasion means that she's going to hit more and do more damage, right? So it's, it's a... It's like a, a compounding effect, right? So though that combo is kind of a bread and butter com combo for her. And then once you get to level two and you can take Barbaric uh, Blow on top of it and you're throwing 12 dice, <laughs> you're just obliterating things. She's really, 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 really fun to play. Like she genuinely one of the most popular heroes to play. And often she felt like she was the, the, the man of the match or woman of the match in this case. Um, when she gets on a tear and she's just walking through monsters, just smashing them, uh, it's really, really satisfying because you're just throwing so much dice at things and just exploding them. Uh, again, the only thing you have to bear in mind is to, to keep her, your eye on her HP because she, <laughs> she will go down. Um, and then as an aside, uh, I threw in a designer's note in the article and this, this bears some explanation because it helps to shed some light on different ways to build your, your heroes. The great weapon, two-handed weapons, compete with dual wielding for DPS. Um, you can also do the one-hander uh, build. I'll, I'll explain that later because I don't want to go too far into the weeds. But in playtesting, we wanted there, again, as I said in the beginning of the show, we wanted there to be parity between the options, right? We don't want it to be like, oh, you always go dual wield or you always go two-handed. <clears throat> they both have their ups and downs, and I'll kind of briefly go through those. So dual wielding gives you two attacks for one attack. Like you get two action rolls for one action. That's, that's the main benefit. So if one of the, like for example, if you're dual wielding axes with a barbarian and you roll for both, one misses, well, the other one could hit. So it increases your odds of hitting dramatically. Now your damage output would go down if one misses and one hits, but you're, you're much more likely to hit. Um, you only ever add power once. It's treated as one action, but you get two rolls. The other benefit to dual wielding is that if you're being attacked, you can parry with one of the weapons and still get to attack with the other one. So it's very versatile, right? So we needed the two-handed option, the great weapon option, to compete with that. So what the great weapon option does, for one, it gives you reach range. And usually when you're dual wielding, usually you're not going to have reach range. It's going to be melee range, meaning it's every square you're touching. Reach range gives you four extra squares that you threaten. Um, so it increases the amount of squares you can affect quite a bit. So that's a benefit because you can tag someone from outside of the range that they can tag you back in the engagement. But the main benefit of a two-handed weapon 
over dual wielding is that when you're going against somebody that has armor, the damage reduction from armor is applied to every successful action roll, right? So for example, if you were dual wielding and you hit somebody with armor two, and you hit with both of your actions, you would take away four dice total, two from each successful action roll. But with a great weapon, since you're only rolling once, you would only take away two dice from your damage dice pool, right? So using Kijo as a specific example, she's throwing 10 dice because she's almost maxed out on what she can do on offense. If she goes against somebody that has um, armor two, it's going to go down to eight from 10. So the great weapon is really good for overcoming armor. Now, for example, if Kijo was using two battle axes, which are damage four each, she would start with 11 total dice because it's four and four plus her power of three. But the armor would be applied twice. She would go down to seven, right? Now, if it was armor three, then the, the, and as you go up, the, the difference gets exacerbated. So instead of taking away three dice from the damage dice pool from going from 10 to seven, you're taking away six, you go from 11 down to five. And then th that problem is exacerbated the more the armor goes up. So we did that intentionally. We wanted the two-handed weapons to feel like these are the armor-defeating weapons. So if you're going up against a, uh, uh, an opponent that has damage reduction three, which is the highest you can get at a base level, and they can get modified up to four or even five with you know, special abilities and game buffs and such. A lot of, a lot of um, uh, normal, you know, mundane physical attacks are just going to bounce off of it. Kijo, on the other hand, can go in there and smack them. So <clears throat> we built it that way so that she can go into the mini boss and boss monsters and really still throw a lot of dice at them. And also, to um, finish my point, I'm sorry, I, I divulged it a little bit, is, uh, or I diverted is to make the choice between dual wielding and great weapon a, a real choice, right? So like I said, Kijo can go into boss monsters or high armor monsters and still overcome their defenses, which feels really satisfying. Or she can go into tons of little uh, wimpy monsters and bop multiple of them at a time. So again, pretty straightforward how to play her, uh, get her stuck in and just start smashing things and then just try to keep her in the game as long as you can. She does get knocked out quite a bit honestly. Um, when you're leveling her up, really just choose the feats that appeal to you, right? Like in playtesting, um, at first we had players who were always taking the offensive abilities, but because she takes a lot of damage on our second um, time playing through the campaign, they ended up taking a lot of the defensive buffs because they felt like her offense was good enough. And then they wanted to just increase her defense so that she could stay in the fight. It's really just, it's up to you. Um, but that's what you want to keep in mind when you're, when you're playing Kijo specifically. Some of the support uh, abilities options that are going to be really good, like I mentioned the Priest and the Alchemist, they both have heal over time abilities. The Priest has the best healing abilities in the game, period. But throwing heal over time on the, barbar on the Barbarian is really useful because she can tend to get away from everybody else. So throwing things on her that are going to keep her healing even every time she activates it helps to get like one more, two more turns uh, out of her. Another really, really useful um, ability, or I'm um, sorry, uh, magical item that you can find in the game is the troll hide belt. Um, and that heals you two red dice every time you activate. It's a really powerful ability. So if you have that and a heal over time spell on her, maybe you found something else that can increase her HP. It just it makes it so that she is self-sufficient and that she just keeps healing every time. As long as she survives, she's going to get more HP and then just keep going. Um, so anything like that that you can find uh, is going to really help you get more turns out of the Barbarian and thus more dead monsters um, or enemy heroes. Anything that lowers her accuracy is going to be really brutal. Uh, the Blind Affliction is the most prominent of those. Uh, blind lowers your accuracy to zero. So it's brutal. It means you're throwing no offensive modifier dice um, when you're attacking uh, a monster or an opposing hero. That's one you really, really want to avoid. Um, martial characters in general are really vulnerable to crowd control abilities, things that target their will, paralyzed, um, fear, terror. These abilities are really punishing for martial characters. You want to try and protect them from that. The best way to do that is with any kind of a, a game long buff that boosts their, their will or by using someone like the Inquisitor who can stop um, a special action from a monster or an opposing hero. Also, as Kijo is Onikin, that's her heritage. She has a once-per-game ability 
It's called the Onikin, uh, Ki Oni's Kiss, which is just a headbutt, and it does raw damage. It's a free attack. So super fun. But basically, if you're in a situation where you like didn't quite kill a monster and they've got like two or three HP left, pop that and just smash them with the headbutt. It's, it's fun. It's really fun just to use it. Um, it can be a lifesaver too. Like it can finish off a monster or, you know, just do that last little bit of HP that you need. Kiju has a pretty modest um, class skill options of two. Um, she only has intelligence one, but Ajax who has intelligence zero, which again, having a, a attribute score of zero in Blood Throne isn't bad. It just means you're average. It means you're like a normal, normal person. Anything above that is like being special, right? So intelligence one is like being smarter than the average bear. Ajax is a intelligence um, zero. However, he took a, 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 a general feat at level one called uh, extended training. Gives you plus two class skills. Kijo took tough as a general skill instead, which gives her a lot more HP. However, the trade-off is that she then invests one of her um, skill points into intelligence so that she gets at least two class skills. So she has a, a bit of a limited selection at first. However, as you go, you get options to get more class skills. For example, at level set three and level seven, every class has the ability to take um, an, a, a, or a general feat called journeyman training. And at level seven, you have another option. And that gives you an extra class skill. I take that all the time. Um, there's also magical items that can give you more class skills, etc. So you can increase that number. Um, at level five, you could take a boost point to intelligence, for example, for a hero and give him an extra skill. Um, intelligence has other uses as well, but that's the most prominent one for what we're talking about now. So there's ways to get more class skills, but Kijo is always going to have a more limited amount of class skill options than other heroes that we'll talk about as we go. So as I said, Kijo is definitely one of the most fun uh, heroes to play whenever we were playtesting. She was always one of the first heroes to get chosen, right? Like Ajax was always the first because the, the tank... He's fun, he hits hard, he's super easy to play, he doesn't get knocked out very much. He was usually the most popular selection. Kijo was like right, right up there. He's usually with a player who's a little bit more comfortable with the game. Would be like, heck yeah, um, the Barbarian and the Rogue were, were always really, really popular because they're so fun to play. And she, she often felt like she would win the match for you because she would just do so much damage. Um, in, in, uh, in PvP, Again, the thing you want to be wary of, whether she's really, really vulnerable to mental attacks and she's really easy to hit. So an, another version of Kijo, like a, a, a hero that's built for DPS, can really do a number on her because her evasion is so low. So you want to be wary of that. Well, that'll do it for the Barbarian. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know if there was any other information you would like. Did you think the episode was too short, too long? Um, any feedback would be really appreciated. Uh, if there's any hero you would like me to cover next or class, please let me know. And you can still back the project over on GameFound. Just look up Blood Throne, the Tower of Sacrifice. Thank you so much for listening, and we will talk to you all next week.